Hi everyone, I'm Cecilia and I am the current Young People's Laureate for London. Um, over the next year, I'm going to be bringing you a series of what I'm calling Nap Chats, where I talk to a young writer whose work I love. I hope to give some space to wonderful writers doing incredible things with their creativity and also to hear from a range of different perspectives and different journeys into writing as well as exploring the power of writing and what it can do. This month's guest and my first guest on Napchats is internationally acclaimed writer and all-round legend Travis Alabanza. Travis has done too many brilliant things to mention here in my introduction. They're one of the UK's most prominent trans voices and also a poet, playwright, theatre maker, performer, commentator, activist, artist, university lecturer, I could go on. Their debut poetry book, Before I Step Outside, You Love Me, was released in 2017 and has been widely acclaimed internationally. Travis's award-winning show, Burgers, opened at Hackney Showroom in 2018 and toured internationally, culminating in a sold out run at the South Bank's Purcell Room. And I was lucky enough to go and see that. Their recent play, Overflow, a hilarious and devastating tour of women's bathrooms, who is allowed in and who is kept out, starred Reese Lyons and opened at the Bush Theatre last year to rave reviews and despite theatres closing down due to the pandemic, managed to accrue thousands and thousands of online views via live stream. I first saw Travis at an open mic night in Brighton, I reckon in 2016, and I instantly thought, here is a special artist and a special person and somebody I want to know. Travis, thank you so much for joining us. It's an honour to have you on Napchats. How are you? I love the name Nat Chats. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Um, I'm okay. Hearing those all like all the bios read out sometimes gives you indigestion, I think, sometimes. <laughs> like you just go, Ugh. um, but legendary. I mean, so glad that you're the young people's laureate. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you know? I'm having fun so far. Yeah, yeah. and I think Nat Chats is a great name. I know you put LOL when you asked about it, like reached out to me, but I think it's great. I yeah, when I first decided on it, I was like joking and I sent it to <laughs> spread the word as like a joke and they were like, no, love it, keep it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's so, great. So we're powering on through with um, with Snapchat. Are you good? Yeah, I'm all right, you know, keeping along, um, just constantly walking from my bedroom to the bathroom and that's my daily commute yeah. and it means I've got no excuse for being late. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Although I somehow still always manage to be uh, late to Zoom calls. I was nearly late today. Um, so I am going to start off asking all my guests with um, what have you been writing lately? And that's not, uh, you know, pressure to say that you've been writing loads because some people are finding it pretty hard to write in lockdown. But what have you been writing lately or what was the last thing you wrote, I guess? Um you sound like my uh, iPhone alarm that tells me to write every day. What have you been writing lately? Get off, stop scrolling. Um, well, I guess I've, I've written over, I've written a bloody play. Um, yeah. so like, but I think um, I was, when I thought about this question, I was like, that was written late, like really lately. We had like a really short deadline for it. I was asked to do it in July and I had to finish the draft by August, end of August. Wow. Yeah, so it was like ridiculous. And that was after like, not having like in lockdown not being inspired at all and it was kind of my like push into like writing again mm. um but at the moment um the main thing I'm writing is my newsletters which like sounds a bit dull and trad but it's like really been a way for me to do like non-pressured mm. fortnightly writing and sometimes the writing feels creative and other the times it feels more like matter of fact but it's meant that like every two weeks I've been writing something for the newsletter. So recently I wrote a tribute to Sophie, the artist, that, the musician that uh, tragically died a couple of weeks back. And so that was the last thing I've written, yeah. Mm. That's nice to just have those kind of little landmarks, as you say, like every two weeks, just to have something to, to write. And also it is creative because you're communicating, aren't you? But it's not necessarily got the pressure of a deadline or this play is going to open at this theatre at this time, so you need to have this script ready for then. Yeah. I think I was feeling like in lockdown, like there was a pressure and I wanted to take that pressure off, but remind myself that I still 
do like to write and I feel better when I write something, but to take the pressure away from output. And actually this newsletter has been such a beautiful way of like carving a space that is online, that isn't constructing a tweet or writing some big caption on a post, but like mm. actually just funneling it in. And we have like a, it's like a hot or not site. So I do like a hot or not uh, thing. Like it's kind of like a gossip mag for the first bit and then like goes into some intense emo like poems or whatever. But it's like, <laughs> <laughs> that's so nice it's completely curated by you and it can be completely in your in your voice and 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 focused on what you want to talk about that week yeah exactly, exactly. yeah I, I went to a workshop the other day that was like talking about kind of small writing tasks that you can do to I guess just keep you keep your writing muscle alive but also have a positive impact on you and um one of the tips was like just writing down three things that you've done that day that you're grateful for even if it's just like making soup having a shower managing to take a little walk like and i've started doing that like writing down little things each day that i've done and they do like stack up and accrue to to like to cheer you up and to make you think like oh wow i'm just like a functioning person in the world today you know um let's take it back how did you get into writing in the in the in the first instance and was it always something that you thought you wanted to do 100 no um i never I, I it took me actually ages to like not cringe when someone calls me a, a writer like it really is in like last year is like really the only year where i started going yeah like this is what i do um but i've always if i look back on the lens I've always been a writer. I just never thought that I could claim it. Mm. But from a young age, like even eight, like it was the way I processed what was going on around me in my life. I had a diary and I took a lot of pride in it. And it was more than just putting down my feelings, which is important. I'd go back and craft things for it. And then I guess when I started to like get into it as like a thing that was shared was when I was 17, I started dragging my friends um, on Wednesday night after sixth form to this open mic night round the corner in Stokes Croft in Bristol and it was free and it's because I didn't get into one of the theatre theater clubs here like I didn't get into the free scholarship space so I was look I had all these monologues I wanted to share but I was like there's only an open mic night so I go to these open mic nights and like the average age was maybe like 55 year olds like it wasn't a cool open mic night there was like a vicar there like there was like a gay vicar there <laughs> And then like loads of like earthy dudes. And then like some poets that like now if they saw this, like they were also there too. But at the time, like 17 year old me thought they were like 50. I'm now learning they were like in their 30s. Um, <laughs> but like, um, and it was my first introduction to like sharing stuff. And I just did it because it felt good. You know, there was no like goal to be a writer. There was no goal. To, I didn't really know if it was a job, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I just did it because it felt good and it felt like, freeing you know yeah yeah i hear so many writers that came um to writing from like a non-traditional route i.e they didn't necessarily have like rich parents and do a creative writing mo i hear the same thing from so many writers that are like i never knew it was a job i never knew it was a space that i could occupy and they accidentally stumbled across a open mic night and were like wow people do this and and so be be began like a, a lifelong love of writing and I kind of like that sort of like entering writing through the side door like that because that was my experience too I just stumbled across a workshop I thought was a drama workshop and it was actually a spoken word workshop and right. that was when I was 18 and it, it completely set the whole path for me um yeah. why do you why does writing or making work, whether that's theatre or poetry or whatever, why does that matter to you? That's quite a big question, but have a well, go. I think even when I'm like, I'm smiling thinking of that memory, especially because I'm like literally around the corner from the place and it's no longer that bar now and da da da. When I think about that me, and especially as someone that right now is experiencing a bit of writer's block, it's quite nice to think about times when it's freeing or whatever, is that it was always about being able to have power over situations that you would previously disempowered in. And so for me, it's about writing gives me an ability to change the story. So like if something happens to me or if I experience this, if I don't write it, 
then it's just happened. But if I write it, I can avoid it. I can do it straight in the eye. I can make the ending different. I can change it. You know, people always call my work autobiographical and I, I often say, mm, not really actually, because I change the endings or I change the middle or I change things so that I can have power. Mm. And to me, as someone that goes out in the world, gender non-conforming, all these different things, whatever identities you want to call it, there's lots of times in real in real life where I'm not in power and I don't have agency. And I think what I've always loved about writing, and now I can articulate that, is that it gives me agency to mm. like have control. I love that, you know? I, I it's addi- That was very addictive. I'm thinking about the poem that I gave at the open mic night to like a room of 55 year olds. It was a really, really bad poem, but it was a poem about a time that of, that didn't quite go right for me. And what I got to do was have this empowering moment where it did. And, and that's when I was like, oh, this can also, this moment that was sad in front of me now with writing is making people laugh. Oh, it's making people think. It's, so it's changing the thing. It's that change that I love about writing. I love that answer. That's one of my favorite answers that I've ever had for that question. Yeah. This idea of, of agency and rewriting. And, and I think that's, it's really interesting because there's a difference, isn't there, in writing between fact and what really happened and truth, as in mm. truth, how you feel it. And you don't have to write an autobiographical story for the truth of, of the feeling and the experience to come out. Like I could write um, a poem about like meeting an old woman in the woods, which never happened, but it's talking about my truth like the feeling of being lost or something like that and and i i like that in writing that you can just you decide you dream it and 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 it happens as you have have decided and and you speak with utter conviction and that's how the truth comes out regardless of whether it's autobiographical or not i think well and i think that like yeah i love i love that because i think that a lot of people think that they have to get locked in by their experience rather than seeing their experience as a source to then do what they want to do. People will say, oh, I had to write it like this, so because sometimes I'll ask people, like, did you want this to be this sad? And they'll be like, well, the experience was sad. I'll say, oh, that's not what I asked. Did you want this poem to feel sad? Mm. Oh, actually, no, I wanted to write a happy poem, but this is my experience. I'm like, well, why don't that be the prompt for you then? How can yeah. you make this moment? And it doesn't work all the time. But I think people forget that writing is playful. Yeah. So you can play, you know? I'm so, I'm so about that at the moment, particularly in this time. I'm like, I need to be, I need to come to my laptop or come to my page with this authority, with this permission to be playful and to be joyful and funny, even if what I'm writing about underneath it happens to be dark. And I remember having a conversation with you. It was either after I came to see Burgers or it was perhaps when we were texting after your most recent play, Overflow. Um, but I was like, it was so funny. And you were like, people keep saying that to me. Like, am I not funny? Because <laughs> like, you were like, I write about things that are really kind of, you know, heavy, but I'm also allowed to be really funny because these things aren't just one thing, you know? Yeah, definitely. And like, it's, I want to hear, I think sometimes people go into a mode when they write, or I used to, I was like, I'm writing about these topics, so let me have to feel like this, they have to feel earnest, they have to feel sombre, you know, and I look back at some of my, like, older work, and I'm like, oh my god, I was clearly like, Bleh. but now I'm like, oh wait, like, that sometimes works, but that's not who I am as a person, so, like, my work needs to sound like me sometimes, mm-hmm. and, like, you know, I experience all these pains with, with a joke, with that, so, yeah, um, Humans really help with that. Yeah. Um, what would you say to any young person watching this who wants to get into writing? Do it. But um, I know everyone says that all the time, do it. But I think that I would say, like, try, like, read loads of other people's writing, but don't hold it as rules. Like, I think that something happened to me about two years ago where I started to be called a writer and then I suddenly started to feel fear about what I was writing and I thought I said oh if this happened first I don't think I would have this career that everyone's talking about the thing that helped me at the beginning of my career is I wasn't really aware of what counted as writing didn't Mm -hmm. count as writing what the rules were 
who else was doing what. I was just like gunning forward and sharing and that gunning forward at the beginning of my like career or like just enjoyment of writing helped so much mm. because it meant that I had a few years without that voice in my head going, is this good enough? Is this writing? Is this real? It's all caught up now and I'm like, damn, but but, and now I want to learn and I want to do all that. But I'd say sometimes people's advice to young people or anyone all the time is go and read everything, go and research. Yeah, but not if you're the type of person that then means that those people, when you sit down, are on your shoulder. Yeah. Go in, like go in and be like, do you know what? I can create my own rules for how this is meant to feel or work. Because, mm. I, because and if it makes you feel good, carry on doing it for a while. I would say have a year, that was it. Have a year of unfiltered you. Mm. before you got loads of time to then catch up and figure out if what you were doing was incorrect here or da 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 but I had a year and a half of making so much stuff without listening to all of everybody else and it really helped because yeah. you know yeah. you know now I can catch up there's plenty of time to hear about everyone's criticisms you know <laughs> yeah and I yeah. think it can be really easy to like get bogged down in the rules of good writing and it always leads me to question who wrote those rules like who who is the poetry police like i wrote this thing for the independent recently about people being really snobby about amanda gorman who is was the inaugural amazing 22 year old young black inaugural poet and you know the the poetry police were out on their like oh yes campaigns again being like it's not oblique enough this poem it's full of cliche and it's just like who says? And, and every time I go into a school and work with young people um, to write poetry, they're like, oh, this isn't a proper poem or I don't have any good ideas. And I'm like, that's because people's voices are in your head telling you there's a certain way to do things. And there is a sense of having to get rid of all that in order to give yourself the freedom and then, then learn and then craft and then improve, obviously, but don't let it be paralyzing. Yes, exactly, exactly that. And I think it's that order people go don't do this now learn this but then you can't find you mm. I'm now at the period where now I'm going back and learning all these things and I'm trying not to be harsh to myself and looking at old work and going oh you did this and this I'm like no no, no baby because the poetry police may have been out but what the inauguration poem had was it connected with people whether or not it was doing whatever it connected with people and it made people feel mm. and that was from that person being authentic and so, yeah, I, I, I held some things in the drafts when I saw that, when the, you know, about people policing this work. I was like, it captured a moment, mm. a feeling, you know? Absolutely. I completely agree. So I wondered if you would be up for reading a little piece for us, Travis. Absolutely. 100%. Um, sure. But I'll read something because it was quite an introduction. I'll read something from my old chapbook in 2017. Um, and this one always calms me down. And so um, I'll read it because that's what I feel like we need at the moment. It's called The Sea. Sometimes I stand by the edge of where the ocean meets the beach and look out onto the sea so I can feel like something that does not have an end. I often get asked what my gender feels like and I want to say more what I wish it could feel like. I wish it could feel like this moment, like it does not have a beginning or an end that you cannot see where it starts or stops, that it just continues to exist or not exist, that is a vast space of nothingness in one way and then holds so much in the next, that it is like the moment where the sea feels endless. Sometimes I stand by the edge of where the ocean meets the beach and look out onto the sea so I can feel like something that does not have an end. And cisgender people often ask me what my gender feels like, and that never really allows me to say what my gender really is. My gender feels like something stopped halfway through, like a badly formatted tape to CD conversion, missing full potential, the second character on a video game without levels, no up or down. It feels like an unfinished, like a body of water, potential to do so much yet eventually bottled. And sometimes I stand by the edge of where the ocean meets the beach and look out onto the sea that looks out over my gender, that pours out over my body, and it makes me feel like nothing. Mm. Thank you so much. It's so long. I love poems about the sea. 
Same. I'm Same. from Brighton, so I grew up. I grew up by the sea, and I love to hear about the sea. But I also love to hear about the sea, written about in a way that I've not heard before, which that poem totally did. And you're right; it's so calming. It's almost like a wave coming over you. Thank you so good. much. It's all right. The sea is like so calming, and yeah. like I don't know. It was actually like sorry, I'm yakking on, but it's good for the good for the the. I'd read so many poems about the sea and then sometimes as a writer you go, oh, I want to write something different. I went, no, I want to then, I also want to write a poem about the sea to add to that canon of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And entirely on your terms, in your voice, yeah. you're like, I'm taking the sea and I'm applying it to me. Yeah. That yeah. rhymed. Yeah. <laughs> She's a poet. And <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we're coming to the end of our chat. I have so enjoyed this. I could talk to you forever. Um, the last thing I'm going to ask is what tips have you got for getting through this next bit of lockdown? My tips would be to lower your expectations of yourself and remind yourself that you, just like you can create your own rules in your writing, you can also create your own rules for this time period that you can choose your time and how you want to do it, you know, and, uh, if something isn't working and you have the power to stop it, stop it. Mm. I love that. Give what it was your tip? I want to hear a tip from you. What would your tip be? I need a tip. <laughs> my tip. Um, I think my tip is place value in the small things. I think we are so programmed towards productivity and results all the time. And for me at the moment, like, we're not operating. I mean, I don't like operating in that sphere anyway. I never asked for that. <laughs> but at the moment, we're especially not operating within that sphere. And I think like getting up, reading an interesting page in a book or making something nice to eat or like going for a little walk, those are all productive and just as valuable. And I think, yeah, if we if we see them as valuable things, um, even watching like your favorite thing on tv to nourish yourself like why can't that be valuable mm -hmm. um i think if we see those things as valuable then we'll give ourselves a kinder day basically so that's my tip i needed to hear that good yeah. thank you so much for being my first guest on nap chats um it's been a real real pleasure um and we'll leave it there